The Life and Times of John Day Wycliffe. Chapter 10. The Close of the Reformer's Life and Labors. The influence of Wycliffe's doctrine are not confined to England. The faithfulness and fortitude of his disciples. The Reformer divinely protected and spared. His retirement in Lutherworth, his sickness and death, his doctrine survives and attains still wider conquest and dignity offered to his remains. There is in Christianity a spirit of enlarged benevolence, which is cheering and refreshing to contemplate. It runs counter to the selfishness of our nature. It overleaps the narrow bounds of human pride and prejudice, and looks out with benignity and love on a sinful and ruined race. Its steps are free. Its path is unconfined. Its efforts are unwearied. Its charity is as wide as the world and as deep as human misery. Such is the genius of the gospel. Its very essence is love. And the moment the heart receives the great impression of its grace, it expands and opens, and there come forth the gushings of a free and unconfined benevolence. The Christian solitude cannot be limited by country or by kindred. His philanthropy embraces the world. Not that he can be indifferent to the claims of home. As a true patriot, he cannot but seek his country's weal and feel his country's woe. But the love of country must give place to the love of man. Here he rises to higher ground. He moves in a larger sphere. Who does not admire the immoral, mortal Howard in his career of mercy, as he is seen forcing his way over burning sands and rolling waves and wilds of snow, with so much light and love in his path that it seems as if the footstep of some angel spirit had impressed our earth. The soul is subject to a loftier affection still, the love of Christian constraints. Spiritual light reveals spiritual misery, and spiritual misery begets spiritual solitude. Spiritual solitude leads to spiritual action, and the effort which goes to recover man from sin and wretchedness is the highest and most Christ-like. Never was there a truer patriot or a pure philanthropist than the great apostle of the nations. But as a Christian, as an ambassador of the cross, the love of souls absorbs him. Our reformer went not abroad to proclaim his doctrines, but these doctrines were carried into almost every country in Europe by his disciples and by his writings. John Huss and Jerome of Prague were among the first and most in- intrepid adherents to the new faith and their testimony to that faith. They both sealed with their blood. Before their time or the age of Wycliffe, the Waldenses formed a long chain of witnesses to the truth. Men more free than the rest of the church appear from the remotest times to have inhibited, inhibited the summits of the Piedmont Alps. Their number was augmented and their doctrine was purified by the disciples of Waldo. The merchant of Lyons had in view to reestablish in life the perfection of the primitive Christianity and the descendants of the V-A-U-D-O-I-S and the A-L-B-I-G-E-N-S-E-S were now to be found scattered throughout Germany, France, and Italy itself. But in no country did the Reformed faith take such hold of a national mind as a promise any very immediate change in the condition of Europe. Its principles were, indeed, sufficiently widespread and so expressed and embodied as more than once to shake the Romish hierarchy to its very foundation. But these principles possess the individual rather than the commonwealth and from an individual rather than from the national consciousness where they left to work out their regenerating and transforming effects. There was in them, however, an intensity and a power which could not but be felt and appreciated. This power passed as if by some electric influence from heart to heart and became the bond of a holy brotherhood. In avowing his doctrines and in maintaining his principles, it cannot be said that Wycliffe was called to make any costly sacrifice. The privations and the sufferings of many of his followers far exceeded his own. With the increase of the Lollards, as the disciples of the Reformation were styled, the hierarchy called aloud for the punishment of those who dissented from the teachings of the church. Penial statues were enacted and Penial statues were enacted and such as refused to abjure their, hier- their heretical opinions were held obnoxious to the secular power. Fines, confiscations, imprisonment, and death followed. But Christianity is the religion of true heroism. The intrepidity, the courage, the invincible firmness of 
her suffering children have challenged the admiration of the world in all ages. These noble attributes triumphantly came out in the character and conduct of those despised lowlids. Many of them took joyful the spoiling of their goods, endured with the meekness of Christ, and the very death of their affliction committed themselves in the confidence of faith unto him that judges righteously for the truth's sake, love not their lives even unto death. Martyrdom is but the outward expression of inward principles. Life is too sacred a thing to be thrown away in no man who realizes the fact that it is delivered from God and dependent on him would seek to part with it, but in obediency to his will. In yielding up his life under such circumstances, the man of God will be strengthened with all might according to that glorious power which constitutes the very essence of Christian patience. He will shrink from no suffering and will go pale in the face of no danger. The Church of Christ has had her confessors and her martyrs in every age. Nor were the Lollards the least faithful or the least heroic. Their fortitude forsook them not even at the stake, they died with a constancy and a joy which bespoke their confidence in the doctrine of life and incorruption brought to light by the gospel and yielding up their spirits into the hands of him who had redeemed them, passed immediately into his unsuffering and everlasting kingdom. Footnote, certain strolling hypocrites who were called lollards or praises of God deceived some women of quality in H-A-I-N-A-U-L-T and Bran... Um, B-R-A-B-A-N-T. Because those who praise God generally did it in verse, therefore, in the Latin style of the Middle Ages, to praise God meant to sing to him, and such as were frequently employed in acts of adoration were called religious singers. And as prayers and hymns are regarded as a certain external sign of piety towards God, therefore those who aspired after a more than ordinary degree of piety and religion and for that purpose were more frequently occupied in singing hymns of praise to God than others were in the common popular language called lollards. Hereupon, this word acquired the same meaning with that of the term Bagheart, which denoted a person remarkably for piety, for in all the old records from the 11th century, these two words are synonymous, so that all who are styled beggars are also called lollards, which may be proved to be a demonstration for many authors, and particularly for many passages, in the writings of Felix, M-A-L-L-E-O-L-U-S, against the Begarts, so that there are precisely as many sorts of Begarts as of Lollards, the priests and monks being inveneratedly exasperated against these good men, propagated injurious suspicions of them, and endeavored to persuade the people that innocency and benevolence, as the Lollards seemed to be, they were in reality the contrary, being tainted with the most pernicious sentiments, of a religious kind and secretly addicted to all sorts of vices. Thus, by degrees, it came to pass that any person who covered heresies or crimes under the appearance of piety was called a lawler. End of the footnote. While the fire of persecution was scorching and consuming his followers, Wycliffe escaped and hurt. Its lambent flame played about him but scarcely touched him. He was divinely protected and spared. Whether it was from considerations of state policy or from the influence of that higher and sterner virtue which characterized the new sect, or from the love letters, love of letters and good men that the Duke of Lancaster and others from the nobility extended their patronage to the reformer, we stopped not to inquire. He was con- con- conscientiously, as he believed, doing God's work in God's world, throwing himself on divine guidance and protection. There were raised up in various parts of the kingdom those who not only favored his doctrines, but were prepared to shelter his person. Not that the missionaries of Rome had become remiss in the attempt to track the steps of the Reformed Party, or that Rome itself had relaxed in the force and severity of her measures, but simply that the Reformer and his friends were within the circle and the influence of a higher power. He can, who can lay all the resources of the universe under contribution can be at no loss for the means of ensuring defense and security to his servants in the prosecution of command duty. Jesus lay in the hinder part of, the, of a ship asleep amidst the outbursting fury of the storm, and his followers may commit themselves with confidence and joy to his inimitable power and unchanging love, knowing that in every trial he is still near to minister consolation and support. Mercifully spared in the midst of persecution and suffering, the rector of Lutheranworth sought the quiet and retirement of his parish, 
He returned to his living so burdened with mental anxiety and so enfeebled in bodily health as to render it necessary that he should seek assistance in the discharge of ministerial and parochial duty. His intense and fevered energy, and an energy which seemed to be unwearied and inexhaustible, levied too heavy a contribution from his physical constitution for the latter to stand much longer against it. And yet his retirement was not passed in inaction. If his living and breathing form was not so often seen in the pulpit in the cottage, his study was witness to no common mental application. Till life's last moment, he never considered his work done. If income Comparatively, he had lost the power to preach. He still had the power to write. Subsequently, to his exclu- exclusion from Oxford, not only did he renew his contest with the friars uh, mendicant, but he composed several treatises more or less bearing and existing and prevailing abuses. Bearing on. Footnote. Among these may be specified his trilogies on obedience to prelates and on the deceits of Satan and of his priest on the duty of the lords, of servants and lords, of good preaching priests, on the four deceits of Antichrist, on the prayers of good men, of clerks, possessioners, on the rise of the crusade against the Ad, A-B-I-G-N-O-N, Pope and its failures, on the sentence of the curse expounded on prelates and other subjects. End of the footnote. But the tide of life was fast ebbing as if it, it hastened to touch upon another and a higher shore. The man who had roused the whole hierarchy of England, had, who had more than once challenged the supreme pontiff, who had made the kingdom echo with his most solemn testimony against the corruption of the church and the degeneracy of society, and whose life was a long wished for sacrifice, was, in the arrangements of infinite love, to close his labors in peace and calmly die, in the bosom of the people among whom he had spent so many years of holy and memorable service. On the 29th of December, 1384, during the celebration of Mass, and just as the host was about to be elevated, he was for the second time seized with paralysis, which at once deprived him of speech, and from which he never recovered. He died two two days afterwards, if not full of years, yet full of honors. Footnote. Admirable, says the Fuller, the church historian, that a hare so often haunted, hunted with so many packs of dogs should die at last, quietly sitting in, in his form in the footnote. He was in his 61st year of his age, but in how few other instances were three score years ever so employed. Let his claim to originality, his intellectual might and mastery to learning and piety be what it may, it seems all but incredible that any one man should have gone through such an amount of self-denying, laborious, and exhausting service to say that he was supernaturally endowed and strengthened is the true solution. His dependency on promised grace and secure was imp- implicit and constant. His aim was sublime and holy. His motives were single and unmixed. His services greater and wider than could have been expected in such an age. Into the dying chamber of the reformer we are not permitted to enter. Time has drawn an impenetrable veil over the closing scene of his great life just because so far as we know time has preserved no record of that event. We may conceive, however, what openings there were to the spirit of the invisible and the heavenly. How full of life and glory were his hopes. With what composure and fortitude he passed through the article of death how his departure was felt at the, as the setting of some greater luminary, and with what regrets and tears he was followed to the grave by simple-minded and devoted parishioners, as they remember with what earnest power and eloquence he had expounded to them that sublime and saving doctrines of their holy faith. With the death of the Reformer, however, expired not the Re- Reformation. Wycliffe left behind him a noble band of true witnesses to God's truth. His poor priests were a body of disinterested laborers and godly men, whose creed and opinions very closely corresponded with the well-known doctrines of their master. They continued their itinerancy and their preaching after his decease. Even at Oxford, his opinions obtained so much an extent as to excite the indignation of the ecclesiastical authorities and to justify the representation that she who was formerly the mother of virtues, the prop of the Catholic faith, the singular pattern of obediency now brought forth only abortive or degenerate children who encouraged 
contumacy and rebellion and so tears among the pure wheat. There the memory of the reformer was cherished with profound veneration. But whether the university ever drew up and passed under their seal a solemn testimony to his great learning and great life is a question which still remains to be settled. A better testimonial to his virtues and his fidelity is supplied in the low abuse which his enemies heaped on his name and his memory. They were forwarded to affirm that in death he had been suddenly struck by the judgment of God and all those physical or muscular effects which follow an attack of paralysis. They represented an inconvertible proof that the curse which God had thundered forth against Cain had now fallen upon him, that he breathed out his malice spirit to the abodes of darkness, nor did they stop here. In 1415, more than 30 years after Wycliffe's death, the Council of Constantine selected from his writings a number of propositions which they reprobated and branded with the mark of heresy, consigned his memory to infamy and execrated execration, issued in order that his body and bones, if they might be discovered and known from the bodies of other faithful people, should be taken from the ground and thrown away from the burial of the church according to the canon laws and degrees. All nations, even the most rude and barbarous, have held sacred the ashes of the dead. Never was it known that any malice or ill will could descend and avenge itself on the deposit of the grave. It was reserved for the Church of Rome in the 14th century of Christian love and in the heart of our own England to do a deed which of itself is sufficient to block the name of the communion by whose command and whose sanction it was done. Thirteen years after the order was pronounced, the grave of Wycliffe was opened and ransacked. There were supposed to be his ruins, were unceremoniously disinterred and committed to the flames and the ashes cast into the adjoining brook. Happily, we should say, named the Swift, for the brook conveyed them into Avon, and Avon into the Severe and the severe into the narrow seas, they into the main ocean, and thus the ashes of Wycliffe were the embodiment of his doctrine which is now dispersed all the world over. And the chapter 10, having written by Peter, read by Peter John Priest, is also known as Brian Dean. None of my audios are copyrighted. Please feel free to make as many copies as you desire to the glory of God.